Listener Production. G'day, it's Rusty here, all set for part two of three of my podcast with Tony Cochran. If you've arrived at this point of the story and somehow missed part one, jump back to the library and give it a listen, especially if you're a two-wheel fan. Yep, there's a significant portion of that first part dedicated to SX Global, the World Supercross Championship he's now embarking on with AusX Open founders Adam Bailey and Ryan Sanderson. They have big plans and are putting a number of those in place right now. It's got great potential. Incidentally, we recorded this prior to the recent announcement of Feld and MX Sports announcing a partnership to try and play in this space, which is the only reason we don't tackle that subject. Now, part one also has some tales with the great Barry Sheen on running the Australian Motorcycle Grand Prix at Eastern Creek and how it all got started for Coco, a man a van, some lighting and immense entrepreneurial spirit. This second part covers his supercars chapter at length. For clarity, I was on the two-litre or super touring side as the categories went to war and I'd eventually end up working for Channel 10 on the supercars side while endeavouring, as I often do, to be Switzerland. Toka, as they were known, batted hard. But the V8 formula really appealed to Aussies and Kiwis and supercars would eventually win in a market that couldn't really sustain two big forms of motorsport. You'll hear some of the stuff that went on behind the scenes from Tony's point of view. We talk more about Baz as well, Barry Sheen. But first, Gold Coast Indy, an event he helped transform. I always seem to get calls from governments that are in trouble. So... um, Hardly back from that particular trip, and I get a call from um, this guy, Minister Bob Gibbs of mm. the Queensland Government. Um, uh, could you come up to uh, George Street and have a meeting with uh, the then Premier Wayne Goss? Yeah, sure. What am I meeting about? Oh, we'd like to talk to you about Indy. Cause, so Indy had been going for a couple of years on the Gold Coast mm. and, you know, had been a debacle. Mm. Um. And it was meant to be privately run. The original concept of Indy was the government put some money in and then once they put their money in, then a pro- this private consortium was going to run it and make mm-hmm. a fortune out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I hadn't taken a great deal of interest or notice of it, mm-hmm. um, to be honest, even though it was in my backyard. I went what, what to are it, we talking had here? a drink. Like, 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 like 92, Nigel Mansell kind of 93, thing? 93, okay. 94, 95, sort of around that mm-hmm. period. Go on, um, sorry. Yep. And I, I had been involved in the first two uh, Grand Prix in Adelaide, but only in, in the entertainment sense. I hadn't mm-hmm. done anything to do with the motorsport side of it. I'd been involved a bit in, in, on the fringes with the entertainment of the mm-hmm. original Adelaide Grand Prix, which were, again, terrific, mm. r- great, great, great days, great days. And um, anyway, so I stump up to this government meeting and they sit there and tell me and all the wonderful things I've done to save the New South Wales government with the... Uh, 500cc bike Grand Prix and they were wondering whether IMG would like to step in and take over the uh, IndyCar race on the Gold Coast. Oh, okay. Shit, hadn't thought about that. Well, we'll, shit, send us all the figures, send us everything. We'll, we'll have a look at that. I'll never forget getting the first cut of the figures. They were 80 million in the red. Oh. And I'm thinking, how the hell have you managed to do that in two or three years? I just couldn't fathom it. You know, I mean, I... I, I um, it was just it was a it was a knockout because I went from being quite excited about this mm. to and then I saw the figures and you know, mm. I was mortified. Mm. Anyway, again, uh, Rusty to save uh, your listeners from suffering complete boredom. Um, I'll cut to the chase. So we we took it over. Um, they got rid of all the management group that were running it, and um, they had eighty staff, I think, or something approaching eighty staff, which mm. was just ludicrous for a one event a year. I think I, you know, I made myself most popular in the first week. I think I fired 46 people or something. Um, and, um, yeah, we cut it all down and we redid it, redid the marketing, changed it to Indy Carnival mm. and um, uh, got a good group of people around us and um, and away we went and had a crack and uh, we went IndyCar racing. In fact, IMG kept the contract for well after – because I, I – within – Within two years of that decision, I, I had left IMG and we had gone off uh, with David Coe and uh, 
uh, James Erskine, we had gone off and started um, uh, SEL. Mm-hmm. So, um, but ING kept the, the IndyCar contract on the Gold Coast for, for quite some time. And um, so, having saved it once, I was my story wasn't finished because I mm. ultimately came back and saved it a couple of more times, mm. which is You're bizarre. very passionate about that, I know, that it's event. bizarre, mm. but anyway. So, um, whilst I was doing IndyCar on the Gold Coast and revving that up and we turned it around, made it a, quite a profitable event, so the government were thrilled, fabulously mm. happy, mm. as were the IndyCar organisers, Andrew Craig and those guys out of the US who... Mm. Tremendous people. I really enjoyed working with Andrew, mm. and he, he was a, a really great operator. And mm. um, you know, you can you can almost plot the demise of certain motorsport events around the world. Mm. And the moment the team owners decided that Andrew Craig had to move on was the moment that IndyCar mm. ended up in a basket case mess there, and then ended up with a, a civil war between Champ Indy, Car and Champ IndyCar. Car and IndyCar, mm. and mm. you know, it, it, it became a, a dog's dinner. Um, and put themselves back many, 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 many mm. years. Um, in fact, I'm not sure they've ever fully recovered com- their glory days as I knew them compared mm. to today. But um, during that period of time, you know, I was thinking, God, this motorsport caper's not bad, you know. You can make a coin here. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing smell all right. Smell a dollar, smell a dollar. I, 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 I'm doing, yeah, smell a dollar. <laughs> you know, I smelled several. Um, so, um, uh, and I like the vibe. Mm. I have to be honest. I, I, I thought the vibe was pretty cool. Mm. You know, um, uh, most of the people that worked in it seemed to be pretty good people. Mm. Most of the um, um, guys on the fringe and you know, the guys that built the infrastructure and everything else were mm. p- pretty good people to deal with. You know, whether it be the sign people, whether it be the people that erected the, the pits, whether it be the people that put the you know mm. engineering in place, whatever. People, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. You know, mm. they, it was a pretty good crew. Mm. You know, I don't don't mind these people. They're kind of my people. Um, And um, uh, so I started to take a real um, observation of what was then Group A Touring Cars. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they were the biggest show in town. We're talking sort of 95, 96. We're talking 95, 96. Mm -hmm. Coinciding with this, and I, I... for whatever reason, right, this is right towards the end of my ING four years, mm-hmm. I decided to do a, what I called a white paper. So I, I just, it was just Tony Cochran, the blithering writings of Tony Cochran. And I, and I just went off and sort of started to take notes and try and analyse why they did what they did and where they went. And, and I actually had it picked as a much bigger business than it was. Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the things that I managed to completely screw up is I deluded myself about the size and success of this thing mm-hmm. um, at that stage at that stage mm. and uh probably i, I remember you know there's you, you get some funny stories don't you in, in when you go down these paths but um i remember i decided somebody uh, somebody had recommended to me it might have been cromley because cromley had a big influence mm. i knew i knew cromley a little there, bit there's a, a story of rumor that that you two caught up on a plane somewhere and then some of the conversations accelerated i don't know if that's true but there was some sort of you knew each other but then there was a convo and and that sort of helped we we caught up somewhere mm-hmm. um it certainly wasn't a brothel but we did <laughs> we, we did catch up somewhere um uh, and, um, yeah, he got in my ear and, you know, he, he thought that I was a pretty good young entrepreneur and he, he got in my ear and started it. Um, he, he found out that I was sort of doing this kind of study of okay. yep. Group A Touring Cars. So, you know, he was really keen to, mm. you know, you're the sort of guy we need. You know, Teague is a mess. You know, they all argue with each other. You know, yada, yada, yada. People don't realise uh, that he, he, behind the scenes, he's very good like that, isn't he? Because he loves it so much and wants, oh, it, wants it to be. It's his life. Mm. You know, mm. I mean, you know, I, I, as opposed to me, I'm... I, you know, I can't work out what my life is. I flip and flop between entertainment and sport and mm. all sorts of things. So, um, you know, I'm I'm sort of a, you know, I'm on I'm a multi track, and he he's on one track. <laughs> um, so so yeah. So Cromley was a big big point. I remember he organised a, a drink at a bar in Sydney. I reckon it was the Park Hyatt mm-hmm. with um, Bob Forbes. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, because Bob Forbes was a mover and shaker yes. in Tiger, yep. the original team entrance group. Um, so he and Bob, you know, sort of got on each side of the bar and bought me copious drinks and... Um, um, He's good after some scotches, Grompo, isn't he? So. Yeah, and, and, and try to convince me that, you know, you know, this is for you, mm-hmm. my son, come and join the circus. Mm. 
Um, and that was kind of interesting. Um, learned, learned a fair bit there. But um, I, I did various things. And one of the things that I did was I had been recommended, and it could have been Bob Forbes who recommended this, I'm not sure, that I ought to go and meet Fred Gibson. Mm-hmm. Now, I had heard of Fred Gibson, but I didn't know Fred Gibson. <laughs> so I, um, uh, uh, Julie decided that I'll go down and I'll watch around of Phillip Island. Now, this proves that I wasn't a diehard motorsport fan, this story. This proves that mm-hmm. I'm, you know, prepared to talk shit against myself. So are you, are you secretly sneaking in here and just, just, just Tony on the hill having a look at what's going on? Or, or you were ever present in the paddock walking around meeting people? What was the, what was the, the Oh, no, I, 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 yeah, I was, uh, I, yes, it was secret, as in the sense mm. that I wasn't announcing. No, but nobody particularly knew who I was. I mean, okay. there was an occasional person, mm-hmm. like Alan Jones knew who I was mm-hmm. because he came from the coast. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there was, you know, if, if Barry Sheen happened to be at an event, you know, then mm. he'd make a big fuss over me and, mm-hmm. you know, tell everybody, oh, this guy's great. You know, he's mm-hmm. a great guy. TC's a great guy. Um, you know, he. I remember Barry introduced me to uh, Larry. You know, yep, he was Perkins, the first guy yeah. that introduced me to Perkins. So uh, anyway, we. I decide to head down to Melbourne and to Phillip Island. So I fly down on a Saturday morning and I, um, I catch a cab out to. I had prearranged. I did ring ahead. I prearranged to go and meet, um, meet up with um, Fred Gibson. Uh, Fred right. Gibson. Yep. Correct. Um, and so I go out to his workshop where the fuck it was. It was in the middle of nowhere. And um, uh, I get out there and we're chatting away and, you know, I'm asking all these questions and Fred's been all, you know, super informative and a young, enthusiastic guy, you know, joins in. Mm. Of course, that's Mark's guy. Mark's guy. Mm-hmm. So Mark at that stage is driving for Fred. They'd lost the cigarette money, so he wasn't able to race that weekend at Phillip Island yep. because they had no sponsorship on the car. Um and uh, so I'm pretty sure it's 96. Mm-hmm. It could have been 95, but I'm pretty confident it was 96. Um, anyway, so we have a big chat. Scafey joins in. You know, he's this enthusiastic, uh, you know, got a gillion ideas and, you know, spitting them out at like a, you know, a machine gun. Um, so I think, oh, this is all pretty interesting. So we spent about an hour, I guess. Mm. And then... Um, 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 Fred says to me, um, uh, Coco, where are you going now? I said, I'm going to Phillip Island. Oh, he said, I, I didn't see you turn up with a car. I thought I saw a cab dropped you off. I said, yeah, 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 I'll just grab a cab and get down to Phillip Island. Hmm. And they just both absolutely pissed themselves laughing at me. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you thought you were going from St Kilda to Albert Park or I something, did, did you? Yeah, <laughs> I, did. I, I, I thought Phillip Island was like on the <laughs> outskirts of Melbourne. I thought, you know, like it might be a half an hour in a cab. Um, Little did I know. Anyway, so uh, after all the laughter died down, mm-hmm. Scafey says, look, I'm actually going to go down this afternoon. I'll drive you. Okay. So hence my, which I've turned into a bit of a famous story at various mm. speeches and stuff that I take a bit of piss out of. But um, uh, hence my famous line, Mark Scafe started out uh, his career as my chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so Scafey and I, well, of course, You've got to be careful what you wish for in life, mm. Rusty, because uh, I was in a car, uh, buckled in, seatbelt definitely on, the way Scafey drove, um, heading to Phillip Island. But that gave Scafey, whatever it was, an hour and a half to ear bash me <laughs> from the moment I got in the car to the moment I, I leapt out of the car. He doesn't miss an opportunity, he does he? He doesn't miss an opportunity. <laughs> My God, can he talk? Anyway, he... Um, yeah, he was like a machine gun with information and, you know, this and that and the next thing and dead keen to see me get involved and, you know, mm. yada, 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 telling me everything about the history of the championship and this and that and the next thing and da-da-da-da-da. So, um, yeah, I had a whole afternoon down at Phillip Island and met a bunch of guys. I think it was the first time I met Glenn Seaton. Mm-hmm. Um, might have been the first time I met Mark Larkham too, possibly. Mm-hmm. Um, so I met a few of the guys. They all seemed really quite nice guys and... and um, I was flying back that night, went, finally found my way all the way back to Melbourne Airport and I think Scafey dropped me in the city and then I got a cab out of the city down to Tullamarine and I was sitting on the plane that night flying home to Queensland and one really apparent thought came over me that the majority of these team owners that I met were all great guys mm. but they all were seeking a real direction. Mm-hmm. 
right? They, they were blundering on. A bit rudderless, bit, bit, yeah. It yeah. was completely rudderless, mm-hmm. but their intentions were great. Mm. And I thought, yeah, you know, I thought by and large, they were a tremendous bunch of guys. Mm. Now, you know, only later did I discover some of them were prime assholes, but, you know, that's okay. Um, they probably think that of me. Um, so uh, away we went and um, the next thing that came about in some sort of chronological order and so by now we're probably in uh, maybe September of – no, not quite September, maybe more like June of, of 96 was John Crennan who was then the very much the titular head of um, – HRT, your um, whole special vehicles, and yep. Yeah, he was. You know, he was the big deal. Mm-hmm. There's, there was no question. I mean, he was. You know, if you if you had some demigods in that pit lane, he mm-hmm. was definitely in that category at mm-hmm. that stage, because um, he ran the whole. You know, HRT, HSV mm-hmm. business mm-hmm. Um, for Tom, and um, he convened a meeting in his boardroom um, uh, out at HSV. Mm-hmm. And he invited all the other team owners at that time. And some of them brought, you know, general managers. Like, that's how come Wayne Caddick was there because Dick Johnson brought Wayne Caddick because yep. Wayne and Dick were, yep. you know, they were an item. They were joined yep. at the hip. Yep. Um, so there's Ross and Jimmy Stone. There's clearly LP was there. Um, uh, just a bunch of people. I'm pretty sure Larko was there mm-hmm. um, as a young team owner. Um, um, and it, it was a... Interesting exercise, and that was the day that I presented to them on a whiteboard my Division. concept mm. of Avesco, which was an acronym for the Australian V8 Supercar Company. Mm-hmm. So my suggestion was we dropped Group A touring cars as a name because it sounded like a blood disorder, mm-hmm. and we and we became V8 Supercar. And it was a it was a it was a good meeting. It was got heated at times, and, and you know not everybody agreed. Mm-hmm. And they used to tell me at that stage they all so had a proposal from. Um, Ah, oh, another sports marketing company whose name escapes me right at the moment. And maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Mm-hmm. Anyway. But, but of an IMG kind of capacity, that style uh, of company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So, because that being in mind, they were talking to me as IMG, mm-hmm. right? Yep. So they thought that I was yep. going to be part and parcel of uh, bringing IMG to the, mm-hmm. to the, the show. table. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that I proved on that whiteboard, which floored every one of them, to be truthful, if they were all going to be honest, they'd say, God, he, he's right. Uh, I proved that Bathurst was a financial disaster for them. Wow. Because they all thought that they were doing really but well. But it's, it's the jewel now. So it, it, it wasn't a... a, a, it, a was, it, it was a jewel for them, as in it gave them a platform that was unbelievable to showcase their product and race. Mm-hmm. It was not the jewel in terms of, in fact... I proved today on that whiteboard and I've still got the very piece of paper from which I created that because you never put anything on a whiteboard if you don't know the answer, Rusty. Mm-hmm. That's uh, golden mm-hmm. rule number one. Mm-hmm. Um, that basically um, it, for them all to compete at Bathurst per car, they were losing about $1,000 um, because they, all they could focus on, there was 300000 in prize money and there was, mm. <laughs> but there was about 330000 in expenses that they got slugged for being there. <laughs> So it was a disaster. Um, so that really got their attention. Mm. And um, uh, away we went, you know, and when we, then we, we started to develop up a Vesco as a company and originally CAMS were going to be a shareholder in it, which they initially were. Um, that subsequent down the track turned into um, another stupid argument and a waste of time and energy in Australian motorsport. Um, which Australian motorsport has a very, very good habit of doing on a mm. regular basis, um, and and yeah, we and we we subsequently I had to tell them that I was leaving IMG, mm-hmm. um, and the trade off there was that um, we bought we SEL bought yep. the shareholding we had, um, which was roughly twenty five percent. We bought that because we bought the time and money that IMG claimed I'd spent on doing this white paper, which amounted to about $52,500. Mm-hmm. So that's why the famous line developed, how to turn 52500 into a valuation of $300 million. Mm. Um, it's a s- slight sort of stretch of the imagination, but um, that's, uh, that's what we did and um, away we went. Mm. With teams owned initially 67.5%. Um, CAMS owned uh, 10% and we owned 22.5%. Part of the big change is you move 
networks as well. You go from the Seven Network, which had kind of um, been the the home, the heartland, if you will, and you go to you go to Channel Ten. My old boss, David White, was there, someone who knew motorsport um, immensely well, and you embarked on a new chapter with them. At this stage, when you've done all your your homework, you've convinced the teams that you're you're the right guy for the job, and so on. Was there ever a moment of doubt between you and the SEL guys that this thing was not going to be good? A moment of doubt. Mm. A moment of doubt. I would say, you know how you have some of those days where um, you, you find it hard to uh, hold everything together? Mm. We, we um, and you talked about changing networks. So the original plan was, by the mastermind you're now talking to, the original plan was that we would start on Channel 7. Mm-hmm. Didn't see any particular need to change, change, move on, or any of the rest of it. So what happened there? So um, what was going on behind the scenes was that um, we were being threatened that if we went ahead with this, that we we would lose Bathurst. Mm -hmm. And it was a great time of animosity. I mean, I had circuit owners threatening that, you know, if we start – because they never charged, you see. Mm. This show used to turn up for free. And I said, no, no, those days are gone. We're now going to charge a fee mm. to turn up. You're charging the punters to get in. You're charging corporates to be there. You're charging we're the signage. Show. We're, we're the show. Yeah. We're the show. Mm. I came from entertainment, remember, mm. where the, the Entertainment Act normally takes 90%. <laughs> You're lucky if you get 10. Um, this was completely novel to me. The the entertainment, the cars and stars, for free. <laughs> were getting zero. Um so I was pretty dogmatic. Some would say he was incredibly difficult and some would use much stronger language that, you know, <laughs> than any of that. Um, but I really stuck to my guns and I said, no, that's how it's going to be. And so we, had, we did have wars going on on several um, fronts, no, no question. And um, w- the thing that really led to the biggest one was over Bathurst. So... Um, uh, Channel 7, the ARDC, so the Australian Racing Drivers Club, mm-hmm. who used to have a big shareholding in the Bathurst event. Yep. Uh, and um, uh, the Bathurst City Council, um, they um, sort of all got together and um, decided that unless we were compliant, which was the compliance was we stayed on Channel 7 and the prize money at Bathurst did not get increased from 300000 um, that um, they would they would replace us. So that led to a famous meeting. Um, there were a lot of this. I remember there's twenty one or twenty two people sitting around this table out at the old Channel Seven uh, boardroom mm-hmm. out there Epping, in uh, Epping in Sydney. Um, Epping. Yeah, well, certainly on that side of Sydney. Mm-hmm. I can't remember whether it was Epping, but it's certainly out that way. And there were uh, good representation there from the Bathurst City Council, including the mayor, who was a guy named McIntosh mm-hmm. in those days. Um, there was a good representation from the ARDC. I remember Colin Bond was certainly there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, um, the guy who'd been running Bathurst for years... Ivan Stibbard, maybe. Ivan Stibbard mm-hmm. was certainly there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Channel 7 had a good representation, including their then head of sport and some other um, uh, hangers-on. Mm-hmm. And um, James Erskine and I went to this meeting and... Um, uh, we outlined what we wanted to achieve Mm -hmm. and um, they made it infinitely clear to us that that wasn't acceptable Um, and that they would, they would, uh, Bathurst would become a two litre event. On its traditional October weekend. On its traditional, Mm -hmm. this is a traditional, Mm -hmm. what was Mm -hmm. in those days the AMP Bathurst 1000. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh uh-huh, I see. And I was, I, you know, there's no, no point in, changing the story now i was mortified i couldn't believe what i was hearing i did i thought well, wow this is rank stupidity of the first order there's there's a lot of them how could they all decide such a stupid decision anyway um we started to get up to leave and ivan stibbard said you guys need to know that v8s are dinosaurs and two liters the way of the future and uh, was that a moment of don't tell me I can't do that like you talked about before? Is that is that was that the yeah, um, you needed? Mm. I don't think poor old Ivan, bless him, um, because he's no longer with us. But mm. I, I don't think uh, Ivan realised that it would have been better just to shut up, mm. because all it did was um, make me go right. We can. Mm. Of, of 
you want to fight? I'll give you a fight. Mm. But I was trying to think, I, I've always been a bit of a smart ass, which you might have noticed, and I, and I was trying to think of a line to come back at, and I couldn't think of anything. So I slowly walked to the door with uh, James, gathered our bags up, got right to the door, opened the door. James walked out the door. I was about to walk out the door. And then the line hit me. I turned around and I said to the whole room, you know, you could be right, but I want you to remember one thing today. The dinosaur lived on Earth for 8,000 years in a hostile environment. And then you left. And then I left. Tony has some pretty wild stories, hey? And how good is it to hear some yards about Baz? We miss you, mate. So one thing I analysed, I thought, right, the weak link in this chain has got to be the Bathurst City Council. Because for them, for the others, if it all fails and whatever, they will go off and do their other stuff. But the Bathurst City Council, that's Bathurst. They, they own the track. They are the purveyors of the track. So I, um, I contacted the mayor, Ian McIntosh, on the side. And I said, uh, Ian, how are you? I'm well, thanks, Tony. Uh, that was a difficult meeting the other day. He said, yeah, it was an extremely difficult meeting. It wasn't the outcome we were expecting. No, Bathurst, I can tell you. I said, yeah, well, if it makes you feel any better, it wasn't our outcome either. either. <laughs> um, anyway, I said, look, Ian, I'm a great believer in dialogue. Hmm. Um, why don't I come fly down to Bathurst and have a meeting with you? Hmm. Sure, sure, absolutely. I said, you know, you, you're representing the best interests of your ratepayers. You don't care about any of this. Mm. For you, it's about the ratepayers. Mm. Oh, absolutely, absolutely it is. Because um, I've also been pretty good at working out politics. <laughs> and so I got down to Bathurst and uh, I um, had a meeting with Ian. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, look, I've only really got one question. He said, oh, God, I thought you'd have hundreds. I said, no, I've only got one. Have you signed an exclusive arrangement with these people? Mm. And he said, no, we have not. He said, I, I, nor would I be allowed to, um, you know. Mm. So I said, so I know for a fact the track can be used. I think in those days it could be used four times a year. Mm. So I know the track can be used four times a year. Um, I want to book another weekend. <laughs> he said, you what? I said, I... I it's a pretty simple proposition. I said, I've even got my weekend p mm. picked out. How so. you, how you place November? <laughs> well, so, so I think it was the third week of October. October we we okay. were roughly two weeks after. Okay. I said, I've got this week out, all planned, October, whatever dates. And he said, whoa, gee, he said, that's only a couple of weeks after the AMP race. Um, you know, I don't know whether we could turn around that quickly. And I said, well, you've got to. And by the way, we want to work out a new deal in our deal, we want to pay you a guaranteed amount of money and we want to make you a partner mm -hmm. in the Bathurst event. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. And I said, now, I understand under, um, you know, Local Planning Act that if I present something like that to you in writing, you're, you're obliged actually to share it with council and with your CEO. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I absolutely am. So I said, well, that's good. So I pull out my pencil paper. <laughs> Here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> Here's one I, I just happened to have prepared. So I hit him with this uh, pro forma of exactly what we were planning and mm. wanting to do. And um, he went for it. Mm. And he said, you know what? Yep, it's not, it's not my role to determine what works and what doesn't work on Mount Panorama. Mm. That's the general public's role. Um, you presented us a very fair financial deal. I can see no reason why we wouldn't do this. Mm. Well... Of course, when we announced it about three weeks later, the World War Three broke out. Mm. And of course, in, in that same announcement, which was pivotal to that announcement, mm. and it wasn't David White, it preceded David White. It, it was yeah. um, Mike Ordsent. Uh, uh, Mike Ordsent yeah. and and uh, the very flashy guy who used to be the CEO. Grant Blackley. No, uh, uh, no, um, um, uh, we nearly had it there. Oh, uh, John McAlpine. John, John McAlpine. McAlpine. Yeah, correct. Yeah. John McAlpine. Um, James Erskine, Tony Cochran and Mike Orson worked mm. out a plot to become the official station for V8 Supercar. Mm. And uh, part of that key thing was that we were going to have a race at Mount Panorama in October. Mm. And um, so that really... Then when, when those two announcements duly hit at the same time, oh, God, all hell broke. So we had... 
we had everybody threatening and accusing us of everything and you know um some some poor journalists in sydney have still never got over that uh, announcement and and still got a problem with it but the truth of the matter is um it was an enormous risk on our behalf we underwrote it ing acted as a promoter Mm -hmm. um and away we went and of course um, you've got to be very careful because if you decide to let the general public vote with their feet, my God, sometimes it can go against you. Mm. And what happened was in that first year, after all their years of history as the AMP 1000, by running two litre cars, I think they had a crowd of, well, certainly way less than 10,000. Mm. Uh, their TV ratings almost cut in half. And then we turned up two weeks later, we had well over 50,000 people there on the Sunday and our TV ratings were right back to the best days of Bathurst Mm. uh, on the other network. Mm. And uh, um, that carried on for two years. And then, of course, eventually their their Bathurst event went kapoop. A bit like two-litre cars that just couldn't sustain. Uh, And it all collapsed. And uh, we rode off into the sunset as the victors of that uh, mm. of that round and Chan- Channel 10 ended up with, uh, uh, very happily ended up with uh, what was a burgeoning rights relationship mm. with uh, um, V8 Supercar. And um, uh, boy, there was there was some angst over that, that, you know, you had to have your tough britches on during that period because... Uh, what was the toughest one? What was the uh, toughest one that came hurling at you? Uh, at one stage... Um, uh, regrettably, I, I, um, I had to have police protection for my daughter because I had quite a few death threats, not aimed at me, aimed at her, which was really disappointing. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was pretty full on. There were some people that, that didn't like um, change mm. occurring and um, I, I got some beauties at, at events. I, you know, I, there's three or four times when guys wanted to front me up and, you know, come and fight. For, can you, uh, what? I'm not going to stand here and fight, you idiot. Mm. No, go, I'm going to beat your brains out, you know. All that sort of stuff. Yeah, it was it was it was it was pretty interesting days, and that actually, for a period of time, I can't even remember how long now, but certainly for three or four months uh, at future events, um, I had a security guard with me most of the time, um, because you get this odd lunatic that had come up and you know want to take you on because I'd ruined um, their Bathurst. And then, of course, subsequently in the third year, we moved back to the traditional weekend, weekend. and mm-hmm. everything returned to normal and. And then, of course, my next big fight at Bathurst was because the pits and everything were a joke. They mm. were just a disaster. And my next big fight at Bathurst was <laughs> then, then to get all the money to rebuild the pits and, mm. and the hard stand and the paddock and mm. the control tower and, and all of that, which was a which was a, <laughs> yet another fight that I took on that I thought initially would be an easy fight, but it was a hell of a fight. But I got there in the end. We got the money. And still today, everybody enjoys those fabulous World class Buildings. there now. Absolutely world, world class. class. I've got a question here from um, from Benny Bishop. He says, I'd love to know how he went about teaching race car drivers and teams that they are in the entertainment business before the racing business. Did that sort of, I mean, you, you had a, a a category that Australian Heartland loved in, in a, a V8 formula. It had gone through some tough times when you first started taking um, – uh, notice of it and and you know clearly that went through a, a rebuild in the way that you shaped the business but what about what about you know um helping some of these drivers become actual stars of the game because i mean craig lowndes was you know an emerging star in that late 90s period and so on i think two or three things i think firstly i kind of led by example a bit you know mm. i was uh, i tried to be fairly flamboyant i tried to be a talking head for the sport mm. You know, I hate it when things are irrelevant. Mm. <laughs> so um, I tried to give the sport some relevancy by, you know, uh, jumping in front of cameras and column space and uh, so on. Column mm. space mm. And, 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 and encouraging writers to write about us mm. and uh, spending time taking writers and journalists and TV guys out to dinners and endless meals and endless putting them in cars of, and of yeah, wine, yeah, yeah, yeah. putting them in cars, mm. letting them mm. taste and experience it. Mm. So I think I was a bit of a catalyst. I think what helped enormously was there was a rich vein of young drivers wanting to step up and become mm. known. Mm. Uh, so Mark Scaife was a very mm. good example of that. Um, but, you know, um, uh, 
uh, there was there was quite a few of them. Lowndes, Ambrose, I mean, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. There was quite a few of them. I mean, Murph, mm. you know, mm. Murph, you know, we suddenly found out that Murph had a real character mm. when we let it go a bit, mm-hmm. um, good and bad. But that's okay. I mean, mm. that's part of the cut and thrust. Paul Morris was a bit of a, mm. you know, cult figure. Became mm. a bit of a, you know, sort mm. of cowboy. Um, so it was interesting, and of course, like anything like that, when they get a bit of confidence. And, you know, you make sure cameras are being put in their face, mm. um, it, it sort of grew. And then mm. we started to actually formalise it. We started to have some um, industry training for drivers and, oh, yeah, and, cool. and the like. So, you know, it, it, was, it wasn't one specific thing. It was mm. just a number of things that started to layer. Mm. And it's interesting, the more we layered... Um, I actually had one focus of d- doing this, by the way, which I'll get to in a minute. The more we layered, the, the more... Um, notice was taken of them, the, the more it got out there, the more the show got out there. Because mm. I was talked to about the show. You know, mm. I used to drive all the team owners nuts. You know, uh, if you if you speak to you know, they're uh, the race, you're the show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. It's, it's, we're mm. we're in the, we're in we're in show business. Mm. We're in the category of sport, and we're in the subcategory of motorsport. But we're in show business, mm. guys. Mm. You lose lose track of that, and we're screwed, mm. right? So we've got, to, we've got to be bigger than large in the life. Mm. I mean, and if ever you need to see living proof of it, look how Formula One's reinvented itself. Drive, drive to, survive, to survive. Totally. Mm. Right? Mm-hmm. That's all been driven by show business. Mm. That has not been driven mm. by how many widgets they now put on the mm. uh, brake cylinder mm. of the left-hand <laughs> wheel. Right? So, so the, the, the reality was that all started to feed on itself. Mm. Now, my motivation for doing it was really simple. I wanted to get women to events Mm -hmm. because when I took on that sport, it was predominantly male, 45 plus, okay? So I could see that it had no long-term future unless we made sure we had women there. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of what I was doing with the... um, to get these guys to get their helmets off, as I call it, mm. and to get them talking and to get them to be, have characters and to get them to be Appeal. interactive mm. was to get women interested mm. because, um, you know, it is a male steroid, steroid sport yep. and, you know, there's a lot of females that could be interested in that if mm. they sort of got wind of it. Mm. Um, so, you know, we had a number of programs. I had some great marketing people, you know. I mean, Penny Glasson was terrific. Yep. I mean, yep. she just got it. You mm. know, she was just, you know, um, uh, a relatively young recruit mm. in the early Dynamo, part though. of it. Mm. D- mm. Dynamo. Mm. And, and mm. terrific, you know. Mm. But, but we had lots of people around mm. the, the joint like that. Shane Howard, who yep. was my CEO forever, um, you know, Shane got it. He understood, mm. you know. I wouldn't say Shane um, led it because he didn't know necessarily how to lead it, but sure as hell, if you could, if if Shane saw what I was trying to achieve, he he would go out and light the fire to you know make it happen. Fabulous nuts and um, bolts guy that can execute like that. Yeah, hey, yeah, and, and and a lot of guys like you know Wayne Caddick, mm. whilst he couldn't necessarily get it in that sense, he was terrific as being the facilitator to make sure it happened mm-hmm. and to make sure that. Uh, we were pushing boundaries and we were trying new things and we were getting more drive out of our sponsorship bucks than we originally got. And, you know, all of those things start to bubble over and next thing, you know, Channel 10 are interested in doing a driver's program and, you know, uh, we, we have the start of those sorts yep. of shows. So it it's becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because mm. everything starts to tumble into itself. Mm. And uh, before you know it, you know, we, we, we would see it year on, year out. Our, our female base was growing enormously. Our crowds were getting younger. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were getting kids there, you know. Uh, and, and then, you know, we did all sorts of things in the kids' space. Again, you know, Penny was brilliant. I mean, she brought Disney into our business. Mm. And, and when Cars came out, mm. you know, that, that uh, Pixar movie. And, yep. you know, uh, how... Perfect how, link. How, Perfect all, link. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. all of those things were just brought into the paddock as drivers of turn it into a family affair, mm. not just a, you know, the 45-plus boys go along mm. and drink as many cans as they humanly can, watch mm. some racing and go home. So we really had a, a wide remit of, of what we thought we could make events and then we started, of course, to add entertainment to events. Mm. And again, you know, for the main part, most team owners went with us. So, you mm. know, they could see what we are achieving and, and the results started to speak for themselves and we started to become a very, very profitable organisation. Golden period for the sport. Tough times too with 
things like the passing of Mark Porter. I, I can very vividly recall seeing you walking through the, the pit lane. I just had a conversation with Craig Baird about, uh, you know, how Mark was and, and the, um, you know, the real state of things after that crash at, at Bathurst. How difficult was it dealing with some of those things in, in your role? That's, they're the tough days, mate, aren't they? Oh, yeah. We, and we, you know, boy, we, we had a few of those. Um, we had the one at Adelaide in mm. the development series yep. as well, yep. I, I, into the pit wall in uh, Dequetable Terrace there. And, uh, you know, and whilst he didn't die at a racetrack, you know, um, the impact of Peter Brock's death just right on the mm. tip of Bathurst, mm. you know, that year. Um, it, it's one of the things that I did was... When you, when you have a big group like that, it's like a giant family mm. on the road. Mm. And because it's such a giant family, you know, there used to be typically eight, nine hundred of us moved to every event. Mm. It, you, you, have, you end up with all the problems. You end up with births, deaths, marriages, mm. divorces, arguments, mm. uh, happiness, um, you name it. And one of the things that I recognised pretty early in the piece was that he was, in those days he'd, he'd sort of come on an ad hoc basis was um, the Reverend Gary Conley. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, I gave Gary a proper Gary Coleman. Pace. Gary Coleman, wasn't it? Gary Coleman? Sorry? The Reverend Gary Coleman. Did we Co- Coleman, 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 sorry. No, no, no you're, right, you're right. I'm getting, right. My, I'm getting my FIA guys yep. mixed up with my ministers. Um, and bless them both. Mm. Um, <laughs> but, um, no, Gary was... Terrific, and and we gave him a proper financial basis to be at all the events mm. and that because I, there were so many problems going on mm. up and down the pit lane, and you know he, he was a great safe pair of hands, mm. and and he you know would help in those moments, and you know the moment that you spoke about, um, uh, you know he was such a young guy, mm. Mm. full of life, yep. young child, yeah, mm. young child, mm. yeah, mm. he and his wife were part of the furniture mm. of mm. everything we were doing at that time, and. Um, uh, it was an immensely hard day and, you know, I, I have to say the thing that stands out for me from that day um, was the professionalism, you know, the way we as an organisation got organised in the background to do everything as well as we could mm. and to manage the process as well as we could mm. to ensure that somebody got to... Because his wife wasn't with him. Mm. She was, I think, on holidays somewhere. Mm. I'm, I'm going to say Noosa or somewhere, mm. but... Um, we, you know, the range to get somebody to be with her and, mm. and you know, the, the, the way we try to handle everything behind the scenes and, you know, most of the team were just so damn professional at it and, mm. you know, made you so proud to get through a day and, and we, you know, we continued on with the program after a fair delay mm. and, um, but it was just a tragic accident. I mean, and, and regrettably, mm. it's motorsport, mm. so you, regrettably, mm. it wasn't the first and it won't be the last because it's just, you know, it's a real sport, mm. motorsport. You know, there's famous Hemingway lines, pretty true. There's only three sports, m- motorsports, bullfighting and, and rock climbing, mountain climbing. <laughs> yep. The rest are games. games. Yeah, exactly. Who came up with the masterstroke idea to make Barry Sheen a part of the broadcast? Because if you said that now, if you said, oh, this, I mean, he was an absolute megastar in Europe that not all Aussies can properly appreciate. I mean, rock star sort of status in England and, and so on. But if you, if you went in with that today and said, oh, let, let's put a bike guy on the, the commentary panel of, of, uh, of a car racing thing, not everyone would, would gravitate to that. But I totally got it because he was such a, an engaging, entertaining guy. He brought something different to that, didn't he? Oh, absolutely. He was a bloody genius. Mm. There's the reason why it's called the Barry Sheen Medal. Mm. He brought so much to our sport. Um, look, I can't specifically remember who. It could have been James Erskine. It, it could have been me. It could have been uh, even somebody suggested it out of ten. Mm. Um, what actually happened was he had a deal with Channel 9 to... Um, host the uh, bikes oh, hmm. and he had a blue with nine. Okay. Uh, we had a couple of blues with nine. Hmm. Um, one was over a dinner jacket and um, <laughs> this is a bloody great story in itself. About him not wanting to wear it. You yeah, mean. correct. <laughs> um, and, and the other one was over money, of course. Hmm. And, and um, so suddenly he was available hmm. and uh, I, I don't think it was any one great person hmm. sort of thought. I, I think it was a collective, shit, you know, she needs available. Mm. 
let's grab Sheeny. Mm. And, um, yeah, he was dead keen to do it, mm. you know, because he, he knew he'd be on the road with me because I went to every event, you know. Yeah, so, mm. Mm. so he thought that was, you know, a safe pair of hands. What he meant by that was that he knew he'd stay in a good hotel room or – and or go to a good restaurant and or be guaranteed a good glass of Chardonnay <laughs> with ice boxes. Um, so, um, yeah, so he came on board, of course, an instant success. Mm. I mean, it was like fantastic success. Mm. Mm. Loved in the paddock, mm. loved, you know, up and down the pit lane, mm. loved by the fans, loved by the viewers. Mm. I mean, he just added, there, there was only one Barry Sheen. Mm. You know, his commentary was just special. Yep. I mean, it was just... Great one-liners. Oh, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, tremendous. Here, here we are at mm. uh, Phillip Island, the mm. gateway to hypothermia. <laughs> um, you know, and I, you know, there's, lo- there's lots of stories I can't tell because of the mm. language in them, but he, 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 he just... Barry was special and he lit the place up, mm. you know, um, and he got on with pretty much everybody. And there wasn't a lot of people that he didn't like in the pit lane mm. and, uh, and vice versa. Mm. Most people loved him. Mm. So uh, he, he was just a natural. Mm. And, um, yeah, God, I, it's not a day doesn't go by in my life where I don't miss him. Yeah, agreed. I mean, he's just a great guy. What do you reckon he'd be doing today if he was alive next? I think about him in the world of bloody social media and everything else and how he'd be with that. Would he be totally against it or, or deeply engaged in it and, and having crazy fun like he normally would? We've all become a bit more bloody PC since his departure, very sadly. <laughs> I wonder how he'd handle that. And and probably the final prong to that question is how his passing affected you when you when you perhaps first found out about him being ill. and and Because uh, I mean, he's been gone now, can you believe it, nearly 20 years. I know, mm. I know. And he was far too young. He was mm. taken from us far too young. Look, uh, I dealt with it really badly, to be truthful. I, I couldn't, it was like I kind of wanted to put myself into a disbelief phase. Mm. I, I did not, I uh, did not deal with it that well. And then, you know, at his funeral, it was, it was kind of a numb affair. Um, and it was one of those weird things where he did, just didn't believe it was really happening. Mm. I mean, you know, because he was, he was really young. I mean, he was, I'm going to say he was 53 or 54. Oh, I want to say even 52. I don't 52, do yeah. I mean, he, he was a young guy and uh, so full of life. Mm. You think nothing's going to stop this bloke. Mm. Um, and, you know, and he had some horrendous accidents in his mm. life where he died on the track a couple of times. So, you know, you, you just don't think that sort of guy's going to be cut down then. it. Mm with a cancer. Mm. I mean, um, but, you know, look, I, I I try and reflect on all the fun shit we did and all the fun times we had together and the crazy stories. And I, I still, to this day, tell Barry Sheen stories. I mean, because you can't, you, 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 you can't help yourself. That's the end of part two of my podcast with sports and entertainment promoter Tony Cochran, the former czar of supercars. Don't worry, we are not done with Baz yet either. Jump back to the library and hit the gas on our third and final part for this one. There is a very, very funny yarn about flying to England with Sheeny, who's been gone now for nearly 20 years. Can you believe it? Seems like yesterday. Plus... Tony's role now in AFL as the chairman of the Gold Coast Suns, his view on supercars since he departed, how motorsport is still in the Cochrane family, hanging with the Rolling Stones and a cool car he keeps in the garage. Listener.